Texas Lutheran University. Welcome, glad you're all here. Um, I was thinking the other day about, uh, you know, what our students have been experiencing the last couple of weeks. If you're like TLU, you're probably just wrapping up your finals or uh, wrapping up your year. Um, and I was remembering back to when I was taking my uh, math exams in college and uh, an advanced statistics cl class with uh, Dr. Brace. Dr. Brace was an old school mathematician, right? So his tests were not using the digital equipment to uh, run your processes, right? Well, he did a lot of that. He would have you write out 23 definitions and then do advanced linear regression by hand. Um, and so I remember sweating that out and getting done with that test and then going back into my residence hall room and walking by uh, Julie Chauvin's room and another person in my class. And she was sitting there studying her math books. And I remember thinking back, and I actually said this to her, why are you doing that now, right? <laughs> we just finished with the exam, we're done with the class. And her response to me was, I just don't feel like I have my head around it yet, and I want to be able to be there. And it was that moment, you know, my senior year, where I finally started to figure out what learning was all about, right? Because up until that point, I had pretty much studied to be able to regurgitate it for the test, and I did pretty well at that, um, but I couldn't remember it for the long period. And Julie's attitude towards it was much better than my own. But it reminded me about the choices we make um, and how we engage the material and how that influences what we actually learn. Um, Today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those kinds of complexities, right? It's not just what we do, it's how we do it, and maybe even more importantly, it's the kinds of relationships and the relational connections we foster while we're doing it. Um, so when we do what we do well, it's not easy and it's not simple. Um, and after a long semester and after a lot of hard work and long hours grading, you all are here, right? So we can talk about these issues again and learn it better. So I really appreciate you coming today, and on behalf of the uh, Conference Planning Committee, I want to welcome you to TLU um, and, uh, and just tell you how excited we are about the program today. Today we're going to start off with our presentational speaker, our keynote presentation from Dr. McKay, who's focused on active learning, um, reaching out and connecting with student athletes. And so I don't want to talk too much about her because Martha Wren's going to give you a more adequate introduction. Um, and then we've got a series of keynote sessions, a series of breakout sessions throughout the day that all look very promising and exciting to engage this issue. So I'm excited, and thank you to all of our presenters for being willing to share their work with us. Um, we're looking forward to it. My role primarily this morning is just to cover some of the logistics, and then I'll pass it on to uh, Dr. Cottrell, our Vice President of Academic Affairs. All right, so in your materials, you should have a conference schedule, a campus map, and a name tag. You will see on your name tag that there's, for some of them, they have a blank bottom corner, right-hand corner, and some of them have a, a letter there. Right? Those letters are codes for your meals. When you, when you uh, registered for your meals, you indicated specific preferences. So if you have uh, nothing there, that means you had no preference. You're going to go to that table, and we've, it's not that it's no good food. I mean, it's good food, right? But it's, <laughs> you didn't indicate a specific preference. Uh, if you have a V on there, that means you've indicated vegetarian. If you have a G, that means you've indicated gluten-free. And if you have an N on there, it means you indicated vegetarian, gluten-free, and non-dairy, right? Please don't grab the N food if you didn't register for the N food, right? We don't have very many of those. Um, and the folks who register for that need that food, right? So um, there should be plenty of food for everybody, so please uh, enjoy the food. That'll be good. While we're talking about food, I would like to introduce you to the lunchbox. It looks like this. Uh, I was asked to model how you take this apart and put it in a recycling bin. So this is how this works. You open it, you detach right there, there. You guys are laughing, but it'll, you'll be surprised by how many people don't do this, right? And there, and then it folds right up neatly, right? Please put it in the recycling bin indicated cardboard, okay? There's another one also indicated plastic. They might actually just have colors on them, so look at what's in there and then follow suit. But you know, whoever gets first, I guess, gets to set it, unless those signs are already on there. I can't remember. Um, but please, uh, please do what you can to help uh, save the Earth uh, and, uh, and support uh, all of our budgets as we reuse the material. 
Um, speaking of name tags, before you leave today, could you please turn these back in because we use the packets again uh, in the following years and for other conferences that we do. Okay, um, following the speaker, the keynote today, we're going to make our way over to Shapey Hall. Um, and that is that building over there, right? But it'll be really easy to find because you can just follow the hordes of TLU people walking over there, right? They're friendly. TLU people be friendly, okay? Uh, and they're pretty easy going. Um, if you're a speaker, you, you should have gotten the, the codes to sign into the computer with. If you don't have them or don't remember them, we will have somebody there to help you get signed on um, and get that going. When we do lunch, you'll be able to pick up lunch in the uh, Shapey Hall lobby area. That's where they'll be located. Again, remember the signs will indicate uh, you know, what lunch you have. I know we have a few extra people here. We ordered some extra food, so you sh there should be plenty of food for you. Um, unless you're vegetarian, gluten-free, and non-dairy, right? <laughs> so if that's the case, you know, we'll, we'll work with you. Let me know what's going on. We'll try and see if we can help you out. Um, da, 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 da. Um, usually at this conference, we get requests for letters for people who have presented. I will send those out to all the presenters indicating that you've participated in that way. Sometimes people need letters back for their campuses indicating that they just participated in the conference, attended. If that's the case, you can uh, email me and I'll be happy to send you that information as well for your schools to get reimbursed for whatever you need to do there. Um, and then uh, the evaluation survey. Uh, frankly, I, I don't have it done yet, but it will be done soon uh, and I will email it out to you and, uh, in the next week or so and hopefully you can provide us some feedback there. All right, finally, I, I want to thank a number of people um, and uh, the, the, you know, nothing like this happens without a lot of support from a lot of people in a lot of different areas. So uh, I'll name a few of them and then just refer to some general areas, but Kimberly Kalinowski, uh, and Christine Castro, Annette Raker, Megan Klein, and Denise McCaskill have done a lot of the logistics, logistical and leg work. That's the, all the unseen stuff that nobody ever uh, gets to see or really recognize it sometimes, but it's really important because there's a lot of it um, and they've been working real hard for a while now. I want to thank our peer educators who are here today. Uh, Amres Diaz, Leslie Flores, Christy Cosper, Ramiro Nava, I misspelled his name in here, but I got it right when I said it, and Summer Swift. Um, um, those folks are all uh, uh, staying here beyond the semester to help us out with this, so I'm excited about that. They either are peer mentors or they're um, uh, supplemental instru instructors or collaborative learning assistants and they do a lot of work with our students too but they're excited to be working with you all today to help uh, to manage the conference. I want to thank the conference planning committee, John Sieben, Mar John Sieben Martha Wren, Lisa Craddett and Donna Cabana, uh, building and facility staff, marketing and communications, Sodexo services, the business office, event services, IT and all of our presenters today. And I especially want to thank our Vice President of Academic Affairs who uh, supports this conference, but also all of the work we do at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, without that funding and the, and the, and the uh, encouragement and support, it would be hard to get any of this done. And we're very grateful and we would like to thank President Dorsey for also for supporting our program. All right, so that's all I have this morning and I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Dr. Cottrell, our Vice President for Academic Affairs. Good morning, everyone. It's pretty clear I got the easy job. I do not have to demonstrate how to take a box apart. Uh, instead, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, TLU colleagues and many colleagues from other institutions, to TLU's fourth annual Engaging Pedagogy Conference. TLU views this conference as an opportunity to highlight and engage and focus on the most important work that we do here. As a university that proudly embraces our identity as a teaching institution, we are particularly happy to have this day to celebrate all that that means. I want to thank specifically our Center for Teaching and Learning Committee, uh, which in addition to this conference works all year to keep teaching and learning at the forefront of what we're doing. And uh, Chris was a little bit modest, but I think Chris deserves a round of applause for making this happen, this conference. And he very quickly read off the names of the other members for the Center for Teaching and Learning Committee, but I'm going to go one step further and insist that they all stand up. So in addition to Chris, stand up, Chris, uh, we have uh, Lisa Craddett, 
Donna Cabina, Martha Wren, and John Sieben. And deep gratitude to all of them for their work for today and for what they do all year long in leading our faculty through the Center for Teaching and Learning. You know, it's easy at this time of year to want to slip away to the beach, to be left alone, to lock ourselves away with a good book. And I hope we all get some of that solitude this summer. But before we do, I hope we can all engage fully in sharing ideas about teaching, about innovative pedagogies, about active learning, about spectacular classroom failures, about all that it means to teach. I fully expect that this day will provide all of that and more for all of us. Uh, thank you for being part of this day and for your commitment to teaching excellence. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce Dr. Gretchen Kraling McKay. She received a BA in art at Colby College and an MA and PhD degrees in history of art from the University of Virginia. Currently, she is a professor of art history and chair of the Department of Art and Art History at McDaniel College in Westminster, Maryland. She is a speaker and consultant on active learning in higher education classrooms. In 2015, she was the recipient of the Ira G. Zepp Distinguished Teaching Award at McDaniel College. She's also the faculty mentor to the McDaniel College Green Terror football team. The January 25, 2018 issue of NCAA's Champion Magazine features an article entitled Game Changing Faculty Programs. This article includes a description of Dr. McKay's work with McDaniel College's football players including her service as faculty mentor to the team. This relationship really started one year when Dr. McKay realized that a number of football players were enrolled in her Roman art and architecture class. Curious as to why this was, she found that they were taking the class to satisfy an international studies requirement. But she'd seen the high level of engagement and passion exhibited by these young men in their sports exploits and decided that she wanted that same engagement in her classroom. She went about accomplishing this by going all in with active learning and role playing exercises and began including these kinds of activities in each class session. Her attempt was very successful. The result was a class that maintained high standards, but also managed to engage student football players so much that they were recommending the class to their teammates. It wasn't long and she was asked to be the team's faculty mentor. The article states that part of Dr. McKay's mentorship of the football players includes teaching them that they must know how to represent themselves as students. They aren't just representing their team on the football field, they're also team representatives in class. The article includes the following quote, Dr. McKay now spreads the word to other faculty. If you're concerned that today's young people lack grit and resilience, you should spend more time with student athletes. Dr. McKay's presentation is entitled, Active Learning for Active Students, Engaging Student Athletes. Please welcome Dr. Gretchen Kraling McKay. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, for being here, and also I'd like to thank um, Dr. Cottrell for um, meeting me uh, about a year ago and um, helping to get me on the radar for this conference, and to Chris for all of his logistical work, which uh, having also directed a Center for Teaching and Learning, um, and not even having a conference of this size, I still know all of the logistical stuff that that entails. So thank you very much. And uh, Martha, uh, has set me up beautifully um, because I am going to be talking a little bit about, about my story uh, of active learning, which very much begins with that class that Martha just mentioned, which was Roman art and architecture. So what I plan to do today is, to, is talk to you a little bit about how did I make the commitment to active learning, and it has to do with these guys that you see on the screen, um, and uh, how I've continued to move into the direction of having more active learning in my classes, and I'm also going to ask you to do some of it. 
Um, since this is an active learning conference, uh, it seemed only appropriate to get you engaged in some small versions of what I have my students do in their classes. So that's coming up. Um, so I want to start, though, with, uh, with this uh, story, a little bit more in depth, of Roman art and architecture in the fall of 2015. So as I've been talking to some of my colleagues, um, you know how when you go into a classroom, if you've, been, if you've been teaching for a while, and you can like survey things and have a running conversation in your head even while you're talking to them? So that's what happened when I walked into the classroom in the fall of 2015, and I saw this row in the back of my classroom of these beefy looking guys. And I know from this picture, they don't look that beefy. Um, we are D3. <laughs> so, you know, take that with a, you know, got to take that into consideration. But anyway, they were larger than most of the students that, that take my classes. And so in the running commentary in my head, even as I was introducing the class, I was thinking, did the Roman gladiators come back to take this class? Like, what's happening here? Um, so I obviously kind of surmised that these might be football players that were in my class, but uh, as it was the first couple days of class, I didn't really engage with them and ask them, like, do you play football? Um, and, and actually, I found out that they don't wear their football uh, shirts, I mean, not like uniforms, but like the stuff that they get from the team, um, just regular clothes, Under Armour clothes that's, that uh, say McDaniel football, because they feel like the faculty stereotype them. So they've told me, since I've gotten to know some of them, that for the first two weeks, they make sure that they don't wear any of that stuff, which I think is, is a little bit telling. Um, but anyway, I was invited after the Roman art and architecture class began. I was invited by our president to go to our first home game, or one of the first home games, uh, and witness the game in our presidential suite. Now, as an aside, I will tell you, I don't really like to watch football games there because nobody cheers. Uh, it's very weird and I was yelling and people were looking at me, so I actually don't really like to go up there, but it was a thank you from the president for being part of his uh, strategic summer thinking group that I was a part of. But as soon as I got up into the box, I bought a program and I started circling the names of the players that were in my Roman art and architecture class. And these are, uh, there were five, but <laughs> We're missing the fifth guy because the time that I got them assembled to take this picture, they had just lost. And he takes losses very personally and went to the locker room and forgot that we were going to have a picture. And the other player said, well, we could Photoshop him in. I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. So um, I just want to kind of, I'm not going to use their names, but I'll introduce you to 55, who's a linebacker, 36, who's a safety, seven and four running backs. And the poor sad sack uh, was an offensive lineman who left before he could get into the picture. Anyway, I watched all of them. I circled their names in the program to get what their numbers were, because at this point I didn't even know that. And uh, they were all starters, so they were on the field a lot. And I particularly remember 55 there. Um, I should also tell you that in the fall of 2015, we were in a five or six season losing streak. So it was not pretty, um, and it was hard. But they, the, the opponent, I don't even remember who they were playing, but the opponent that they were playing that day, um, they stopped them on fourth and one at the goal line, and 55, who's the linebacker, ripped his helmet off, ran around like a nut. He was uh, hugging everybody, and you know, whatever that is that they do with their chest. And I, and I was watching that from the box and I thought, I want some of that. Like, I'm not so delusional to think I'm gonna get that much. Um, you know, I don't like to set myself up for failure. Um, but I felt like, you know, they took this Roman art and architecture class for some reason. We have a vast array of classes that could count for the international requirement that Martha was mentioning. So. There must have been some initial interest to take Roman art and architecture, and so my view was, I've got to honor that, and I'm going to figure out a way to keep and get some of this level of excitement in my class. And it was in the box, watching 55 dance around, um, that I made a commitment to have active learning in every single class session of that semester. I had never tried that before. I had begun to experiment with active learning. So those of you who haven't 
um, really tried very much of it or maybe have just kind of begun. I wouldn't recommend saying that, like go all in. Um, but I was ready because I had been uh, experimenting a lot with a lot of my classes. And so I felt like it was time to really step it up and so I made myself that commitment. And I made them the commitment as well and I felt very strong about that and I'll be sharing with you a time when I really almost like decided not to do it and I'm glad that I didn't because, uh, because of what I found out later. So a year after the class ended, so I was able to have active learning in every single class period of the fall semester of 2015 in Roman art and architecture. A year later I decided, you know, I wonder what they remember since I made that as a uh, commitment and a change. You know, I kind of wanted to know, like, well, do they remember anything? Did they learn anything? And so a colleague of mine offered to run a focus group. He's like, yeah, bring the guys back. We can talk and see, like, what they remember. Well, they remembered a lot. And they remembered things that I was, that I actually had forgotten, <laughs> to be honest with you. I was like, we did what? Um, and, uh, and they also remembered things that, um, that w w was kind of surprising to me, because they were maybe uh, sessions that I kind of put together at the last minute, or just things that I was kind of surprised me about. Um, and this led to a conference presentation uh, of the title of this chapter, and after I gave the conference presentation, I was approached by editors of a book on active learning. Um, some colleagues of mine in Greece were uh, editing a volume on active learning, and they asked me after I did that conference presentation if I wanted to submit something. So this just came out a couple weeks ago, the book, and I'm chapter eight in there, engaging the non-art history student, A Tale of Five Football Players, and others in Roman art. And really what's in this chapter is very much about what came out in that focus group of what they remembered. So I'm gonna share some of that with you and then I'm gonna go on to another class which I just finished this semester um, that also has some active learning uh, components to it and also has some connections to, uh, to the football team. So one of the things that came out in the focus group um, that my colleague ran for me, and I was there to kind of answer questions, but I was off in the corner and just kind of taking notes, um, was that it was okay to be wrong. And you're looking at an image here that's called the poultry cellar of Ostia. And it's a very unusual image. You won't find it in any textbooks. Um, the class period that this represents or that this was a part of we had just finished looking at the major monuments of the Emperor Augustus, which is in any class on Roman art and architecture. You, he's one of them, he, he's the first emperor, all of his uh, monuments are important, and so we had just gone over that. But one of the goals I have for this course is I also really want the students to know what it's like for the everyday Roman because most of the stuff that's in the textbooks are all like the upper class, who we call the patricians and the emperors. And I really feel like the everyday experience in Rome is very important to try to highlight. And the everyday person in Rome or the class that we call the plebeians, who are usually the people that had businesses, they made art too. It's just it's not often talked about. And when they did make art, they tended to do it for their tombs. And their tomb art tended to reflect what they uh, did in life. So if they had a business, then they would show that on their tomb marker. And it, it tended to always be in an abstract style. So this is an example, I'm giving you a little art history today, just to get a little bit of that. <laughs> Yay! Um, so this is a very abstract style, and it's often harder for them to analyze it than something that looks more three-dimensional and Renaissance-like, where there's depth and perspective in the painting um, that our eyes are kind of used to as Western uh, viewers. But I want them to be familiar with both styles of art. So the day that we were talking about this image, I decided that they would be paired up. And I sometimes pair students up ahead of time, and sometimes I let them pick their pairs. But one of my course goals is always to make sure that the class has a, a good bond and that everybody knows each other. And this class was about 20 people. So I sometimes mix them up. It just happened that this day, um, two of the football players, 55 and number four, um, were teamed up together for this particular, um, for this particular image. Everybody got an image, so there were like 10 of them. 
Uh, I led them through how do you read an abstract work myself with the whole class. So there was one that I used to kind of sample how you begin to understand. And, then, and they'd already been using uh, art history vocabulary. So this is about halfway through the semester. So this isn't like right out of the starting gate. We've been doing some things already. So we went through uh, an example together as a class, and then I was, and then they were pairing off, and they always have a PowerPoint presentation um, in my course management system. We use Blackboard, and that's a way for them to look more closely at the image. I even told them, like, don't even bother looking for it on the internet because you won't find it. Um, so while they were uh, while they were getting themselves sort of in their pairs after I presented who was going to work with who, apparently I don't remember this. Apparently I said, and it's okay to be wrong because after they worked in pairs, they were going to present and lead a discussion of their image. And so I said like something like, and it's okay to be wrong, like we're just discussing. Well, I didn't remember saying that, although it does sound like something I would say um, as I'm getting everybody organized. But this was really important to them. And they spent a significant amount of time in the focus group talking about why this stood out to them. And the reason is, is because most of the time they said their classes are high stakes tests, where if you're wrong, your grade really suffers. And one of the things that they really appreciated about this class and the way that it was set up with active learning and engagement was that they could make a hypothesis and not get scorched if it was wrong. And they felt like because of that, they could take more ownership of the types of things that they were doing than if everything was this high stakes, being wrong really knocks you down. And so I actually thought that this is not something that I really thought about um, as a byproduct of active learning and having um, ideas spread in this kind of way. But I think it's really important, and I've really begun to think about this more and more intentionally, because like I said, I think I said that just like, oh, it's okay to be wrong, like just, you know, get yourselves figured out. So I've been thinking about that a little bit more from their, from their comments. Um, I think number 55 actually said, he told me after I said it's okay to be wrong, I think he murmured to his partner, that's good because there's no way we're getting this one right. Um, and it is weird. I mean, it is a weird image and I was even looking at my slides last night and I was like, are those rabbits over there? Oh wait, I have a, I have a fancy pointer. So like, even though it's a poultry cellar and these are the poultry hanging up, um, like these look like rabbits and I don't know if those are monkeys. I mean, really, this was again just an exercise to get them thinking and talking and presenting and discussing, uh, which they definitely did. So another thing that came out of the focus group, um, again, I was thankful for my uh, communication professor uh, colleague, excuse me, um, because he's really excellent at focus groups and getting um, getting ideas out of the students because they, they were sitting around and he's like, what other classes do you remember? Like what, what, you know, you mentioned like it was okay to be wrong, but like what are some other classes that stand out to you? And uh, one of them said, oh, I remember that poll. <laughs> and you know, and again, I'm like taking notes over here. I'm like, poll, like <laughs> we didn't talk about polls, you know? And so as he's describing, you know, the my colleague is, you know, coaxing some information out of him. And I had to pipe up. I'm like, do you mean Trajan's column? And he's like, yeah, 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 that's it. That emperor with his column. I was like, but, you know, at this point, I was like, look, I'll take poll. Like, I mean, this is a year later. You know, it's like, he, I'm glad. Um, and this was also particularly gratifying because I remember distinctly when Trajan's column rolled around in the content calendar, uh, I remember distinctly, it was like mid-November, so like Thanksgiving's looming. Um, I was tired. I just remember not having a clue about what to do for this day. I just was tapped out. I think I even went on to social media. I was like, hey, art history peeps, like what do you do for Trajan's Column? I am out of ideas. I mean, I just really, I just felt tapped out. And I was really just thinking, you know, maybe I should just lecture, you know, I know it like the back of my hand, and I want to just put an aside here, uh, I am not an anti-lecture person, and I don't feel like 
those conversations benefit anybody, um, that active learning should be instead of lecturing and lecturing's bad. I mean, I just, I, there needs to be a blend of all kinds of approaches that meet the students and help them where they are. There are students who do really well with lecturing. I just don't think everyone does. Um, but, you know, every class, I think, should really have a balance of, of materials. So I just kind of wanted to put that out as an aside. But anyway, I was really tempted to just lecture for the, and my classes are 90 minutes. So 90 minutes is actually kind of a long time to lecture, um, even though my students have told me subsequently, they're like, yeah, yeah, but your lectures are good. Like, we don't mind. And I was like, well, still, like, you know, I have to think about what's best. Um, in any case, I was tempted to lecture, but I was like, no. I made the commitment, I'm gonna come up with something, like I will, um, and I can be very fierce when I'm you know, determined to do something. So, but I think it was like on my drive to school, I have about a 45 minute drive to my campus where I was still like, what am I gonna do? It's like, you know, it's like in an hour. So I think what I did, what I remember doing, is I put images of Trajan's column together. I gave them an initial lecture of that, it's in the, that the column is in the Roman Forum, which we had already talked about extensively uh, in the class. So the Forum of Rome is a very public space. Almost every emperor adds on to it. So it's like a continuous sort of expansion of, of the space in uh, the capital city of the Roman Empire. And uh, dedicated by Trajan or by the Senate in 113 CE and uh, celebrates the Dacian campaign. So this is where you have your first active learning example. So this is a little bit what I had them do in the class. Uh, I'm not gonna have you stand up and say what you think, although maybe we can see if some people wanna shout some things at me. You're all kind of dark out there. Um, but I'm going to show you two images of the column, and I, I, I went through the slides this morning, and even if you're in the back, I think you can see fairly well. Um, so, uh, but those of you in the front should be able to see pretty well. Um, with a partner or just somebody that you're sitting next to or you might need to turn around to talk to somebody behind you, I want you to find the emperor and talk about what is he doing, so if you can identify him and then what is he actually involved in, and then why do you think he, was, he would be shown this way? So I'm going to have you guys do this, just jot down some ideas. Find the emperor if you can on the left-hand image and on the right-hand image and see why would he be shown this way. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes and then I'm gonna ask. Okay, I hate to stop the uh, great energy and the hum. I always hate doing that in my classes too. Like I get such great humming and energy going and then you have to break in and you know. Uh, so who would like to shout out from the darkness um, of where you either see the emperor or want to make a guess of what he's doing? Anybody want to take a, take a Yelp? A lot of talking. Anybody know where he was? It's okay to be wrong. Yes, it's okay to be wrong. <laughs> Uh, this one? Okay. He, he is an officer, but not the emperor. Okay. Yep. Is, the, is he the one everybody's looking at on the right hand side? Here? Or? Top left. Top left. Oh, in this one? No, uh, no, you have on the right hand side, the top left. 
top left, everyone's no. staring at that. Okay, that's a guy who's actually um, carrying the standards. So he is important because the, the Roman standards were always carried into battle. All right, how about, how about this side? Did anybody pick him out over there? Yeah. So he is here, and anybody know what he's doing there? Mingling. I like that. He's actually confer he is conferring with his officers. And one of the important things about this image is it shows how the Roman army went and built everything that they needed. Um, part of the column's message to the Romans was, we can go anywhere, we can build anything. Uh, we can cross the Danube River, uh, we can build boats, bridges, what, uh, this is a little platform for the emperor that you can tell is out of stone or brick, it's not just like a little thatch. Um, so this is uh, really propaganda that's, um, you know, we can give the, the emperor anything that he needs. Okay, and then just to cut to the chase, uh, he's here on this side. Does anybody know what he's doing there? Being benevolent. Being benevolent, in a way. He's making a sacrifice. So he's making a sacrifice before the campaign begins, which is what all of the army would have to do before they um, undertake, they would have to get the, the, um, uh, the okay from the gods and making sure that it's blessed um, in going. So that's what he's doing here. So, oh, I'm sorry. So he is, in a sense, doing, um, you know, gi making an offering, giving out something. Okay, so that's an example. So in that particular class, this is what they did. And the important thing for me is that they remembered this a year later. Um, and I think if I had just given them some facts about the column of Trajan or the poll, as I now think of it, um, I'm not sure that they really would have remembered. Um, so I was happy that I didn't sort of give in um, and not come up with an active learning for the day. So if there's ever a time where you want to do it and you're not sure, you can maybe think of this, ex of this um, experience of mine and, you know, try it anyway. See if you can do it. Um, so a little bit back to my story to get us more up to the uh, present day. Um, in the fall of 2016, just around the time that we had the focus group, I went to one of their games and they broke their losing streak. Uh, and somebody captured me cheering that moment um, on camera. And it was in the last five seconds with a field goal, so everybody was, you know, sucking air. Um, and then about two weeks later from that moment, I became the mentor uh, to the team. And the way that that happened, uh, I, after they won, and I had, again, some players in my class, and I was like, you know, Gettysburg's actually closer to me than my own campus. Maybe I should go to the uh, away game and, uh, you know, support the guys, rah, rah. And so I did, and I posted on social media that I was cheering on the Green Terror at Gettysburg, and our NCAA rep, uh, the faculty athletic representative, uh, saw that post, and on Monday, he sent me an email that said, would you like to be a mentor to the team? And I was like, yeah, because I felt a little bit like a stalker at the Gettysburg game, like, why is she here? And like, all these parents were like bringing subs after the game, and I was just standing there like, I don't know where I'm supposed to be, but here are the buses. Um, so I, you know, I must have missed the memo, because he'd been trying to get a faculty member to mentor every team that we have on the campus um, for several years, but I didn't really know that. So I said yes, and I met with the coach, and uh, we kind of had to work out, like, well, what will I do? And so most of my work has been with uh, students that are having academic difficulty, but then I also have a lot of players in my class because of the teammates um, that Martha alluded to in her introduction. They're, like, spreading the word about how my classes are. And I just had to throw this in because I made it into the team picture. And as somebody who was never on a team and never did anything like that, when the coach said, like, we have our team picture on September 3rd, we want you to be in it, I was like, oh my god. So, uh, so there I am, way up at the top. I'm the only person smiling in that row. Apparently you're not supposed to smile <laughs> when you're coaching or being a mentor to a team, but I was happy. So. Um, Another thing that I often do is I do attend their, um, their camps. So they have um, a summer camp and I address the new players um, when they're there and the whole team. The, the coach is very much about um, emphasizing academics 
and their grades. Uh, we are very much uh, a good team in that respect, the two of us uh, on the same page. I'm not sure I would be doing this if that wasn't the case. Um, anyway, he said, I really would like you for you to come to a couple of practices and you know, see them. And also, like anything that you want to say afterwards to um, you know, buck them up, whatever, grade-wise. And, um, and I also uh, instituted a peer mentor program within the team. So some of the students who are very good students on the team mentor the new players because I want them to have someone that they know football-wise, but also um, who, who don't struggle in the classroom and can kind of guide them a little bit. So those are some of the things that I did. But anyway, I went to one of the practices when it was right before um, our uh, registration period for the spring semester. And I was teaching medieval art, and I wanted to invite them to my class if they were so interested. And um, I, you know, I tell them all the time that I do use active learning, but this is not raise the GPA of the football team. This is not basket weaving or something like that. I'm always very nervous about that. And they're like, you don't even need to say that anymore, Dr. McGay. Everybody knows you're going to write a gazillion papers for you. So I'm like, oh, good, good. That's, the, that's what I want the word on the street to be. Um, and anyway, uh, it turned out that 20 players signed up for medieval art this past spring semester. And I had 30 um, people in the class as the cap. So uh, I had to once again rise to the level of, OK, we're going to have active learning in, you know, in this class. And I'm going to talk about a couple of different things that I did. And then there's also going to be another example of uh, an active learning that you can participate in uh, in just a few minutes. So. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about laptops in the classroom, because I know that that's always, you know, we have a couple of months before that's going to make its rounds on social media again. Sometime in August, when everybody's getting their syllabi together, it'll be like, should you ban them, should you not ban them? Well, you can see from this, I don't. Um, because I often need them, as I think I mentioned earlier, sometimes they have to download the PowerPoints to see the images, like some of you that were in the back probably couldn't see Trajan very well um, on, his, uh, on the images that were there. So I have them use the laptops all the time. And what you're actually seeing in these two photographs is that medieval art class that I uh, just finished teaching. Um, but we're in the middle of a reacting game at this particular point. And where I sit in the classroom, I can pretty much see all of the laptops, and they all have texts on them. It's not social media. It's not anything where they're you know, surfing the web or whatever. They have on Blackboard, uh, the, excuse me, I should back up. The game that we're using here is the Second Crusade game. It's set in the city of Accra in 1148, and they're trying to decide whether or not to have a Second Crusade. Is it justified? And then they have to decide where they're going to attack if they do decide to go somewhere. So because it is the Second Crusade and because just war is one of the things that they're debating, I have them read excerpts from the Bible, from the Quran, and from Augustine's City of God. So I make all of those texts available because there are free versions of it on the web, and I put that into our Blackboard site. So a lot of the um, laptops that you see open have those texts in front of them. They also get a game book that has a lot of other texts that are in it that are printed for them, so they also have that as a resource, as a resource and a research tool. Um, but I do allow laptops um, in for, for both of those reasons. So as we got into the debate, they decided that, yes, the war is justified, but then they had to decide where to go. Which city are they going to attack for the Second Crusade? And as I say on this slide, we were in the Second Crusade, the Council of Accra, or, in other words, that time when Patriarch Volker lost his cool, and I just am so blessed that I had the camera out, my iPhone out, um, when he was at the podium uh, to give his speech because he really did lose it. Um, and the reason was is because they, so he, he was, the, the student that you see here was cast as the patriarch. He is the convener of the council. So he has to make sure things run smoothly. This is, uh, again, a reacting game. So those of you that can't come to the breakout, I wanted to give you a little bit of that. Um, I'll be talking more about it at the breakout session. 
But the, that student has to run the council, so he has to make sure that everybody is heard. If they want to speak, he has to make sure that people at the podium will speak. Um, if I go back one, you can see here there are two different students that were at the podium for that particular day's uh, debate. And there's also give and take from the floor after the person finishes their speech. He also has a gold box in front of him because Patriarch Volker found the true cross in Crusade Number no. 1, which was uh, the main reason that they attributed to having won the first crusade. And so the character who plays the patriarch has to make the reliquary of the true cross. He was not pleased with me. Uh, that this was part of his uh, job. And he came in with this box that he spray painted gold, which is kind of like lame. I'm like, no jewels, <laughs> like not even one. And when he, uh, when he gave it to me, I was like, I kind of shook it. I'm like, where's the cross? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you got to put a stick in there or something. Like, you know, what if somebody asks you, like, they want to see the true cross? He's like, oh, God. So he ran out, got a stick, stuck it in the, the box. Um, in any case, the moment that I took of this picture, standing in front of a map of the first crusade, because I didn't want to give away like what happened in the second crusade, I made the maps available. And they had just spent two class sessions, remember they're 90 minutes, two class sessions quoting City of God by Augustine, Pope Eugenius II's papal bull on crusading, um, the Bible, um, some other texts that are in the game book about how the war was justified or a crusade at this time was justified because Zengi, the Muslim ruler, had attacked and totally sacked the city of Edessa. And they had a very hard back and forth about this because there are some characters who are against it and they have to argue very vehemently. And in reacting games, there also are always these indeterminate characters. These are characters that they're not really sure what they think about everything, but they might care very deeply about one or two issues. So there's always like a little bit of a sway to the vote so that you're not just um, having two camps sort of yelling at each other also known as our news <laughs> lately. Um, so there's always some of this like mo um, movement for persuasion in a reacting game. So after they had just spent two days, right before um, this student, the patriarch, got up for his speech, right before him, the king of France, Louis, uh, got up and said, I think we should attack Damascus. And that's when the patriarch got up in his hands like this. He's like, Damascus? He said, we just spent two days debating about Edessa. And I mean, he really, it was like, he really lost it. I mean, and, and as I will share with anybody who goes to the breakout session about reacting, I have some quotes from some of the students that participated because I knew I was going to be doing this breakout session and I wanted their perspective after having done the game. And he admitted, he's like, oh, he was like, that day, like, I forgot I had practice. I forgot everything. He was like, it was all about, like, where are we going to go? And I just can't believe that somebody said Damascus. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I kind of got that um, from the picture. Um, so, so in the end, they, he, and, and um, just a couple other things that happened. There can also be um, surprises that the, um, that the instructor, so the instructor becomes what's called the game master. I've never been so happy that my initials are GM uh, because I can just sign all the emails GM and they don't know if it's game master or Gretchen McKay. Um, but anyway, uh, there are a lot of characters that have like secrets and in this particular run of the game, there's a, there's a character who's secretly an assassin. And um, there's another one who is secretly um, wanting the crusade to be uh, directed towards Damascus. And so the student that secretly wanted it directed to Damascus sent me this note and said, I want you to tell the patriarch that it should, you know, I can't remember exactly what was in the note, but it was something that to try to sway the vote away from Edessa. And I decided that the patriarch should make the call because he was running the council. So I walked up and it was, the game was going on. It wasn't like before class because this happened during class that the student sent me this note about, um, I think it was, um, Nuruddin, who's the son of Zengi, is on the move and he's in Damascus. It was all a lie, but it was trying to get Damascus to be the target. So I took the patriarch out into the uh, hallway and I gave him this note. And, and I mean, he, this, the seriousness of what he was like, you know, and he goes, oh, I don't, what should we do? And I said, I don't know, it's your call. Like you run the council. So what do you, what do you think you should do? And he was like, 
I think I have to tell them. Even if I lose the vote, this is important. I was like, okay. You know, I mean, I thought he was going to be like, oh, this is somebody like trying to do something. Like, this is baloney. You know, and so he went in and he's like, guys, 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 I got a really important announcement. You know, you know, and then he, you know, he made the announcement about this. But anyway, he still, he still won the uh, debate to go to Odessa. But anyway, just, that just kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse, I think, of how they really do take it very seriously. And it really is an experience. Like, I would really argue that this is experiential learning, even though it doesn't meet all, object or all the objectives and the definitions of some places, it really does move students out of their current situation or where they currently are. So that's a little bit about reacting. Um, but I also used active learning, uh, and, and I should also mention that the, that the game for this class I use at the very end of the semester. So there is a lot of lead up time where I'm kind of preparing them for this kind of educational experience of doing research and doing lots of reading and writing. They have to write three papers. Um, they have to be three pages long. They have to have sources cited correctly uh, that are germane to the three topics of the game itself. So I have a lot of preparation to do with them to get them ready for that, even though they don't realize necessarily that I'm doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do is share with you another example of active learning um, from this time from the medieval art class. And um, there's going to be a paper that's um, going to be passed around to you while I'm sort of setting up the, uh, the assignment. One of the things that I like to do in my classes is rather than always have it be um, giving them the solution to whatever the situation is that the artists faced, because artists are solving problems, um, or architects, is I sometimes try to set it up where I give them the information that would have influenced the artists, or in some cases the architects, and they have to wrestle with the problem and come up with a solution. So yeah, great, there's some lights. So what you're going to do is exactly what my students did this past semester, although the, the drawing portion of the assignment I'm omitting today, because we're in the, a very difficult room to have any kind of drawing going on. But what you're given is a theological text um, which influenced the architects of the sixth century in Byzantium. And at this particular time, the Emperor Justinian, who um, is shown in the center here with a purple robe, he wants a new church. He wants a new church plan. And for those of you that are not familiar with, with what medieval churches looked like prior to him coming on the scene, they're basically like the big long hallways, which we call a basilica. So the pews facing the altar, that's what they all look like. So Justinian wants to have a church plan that reflects the ideas that you have on the paper before you. And nothing has changed in terms of the way that the liturgy is performed. So nothing that the, the, the priests and the performance of the act of the liturgy haven't changed. It's just those ideas that are from the theologians that you see on the text. So what I want you to do is see what you can make. So you're the, what I gave you, though, is the whole day's plan that the students have to do. So what I want you to do just for the next few minutes is just to concentrate on the text that's at the bottom of the page and try to figure out what the themes are that that writer, Pseudo Dionysius, is talking about. And then think about what a church might look like if you were going to incorporate those ideas. So the first, first part of this, this in-class assignment is just to figure out what's he talking about, and then how might that be translated into architectural terms for a church plan, okay? So I'm gonna have you do that. You can pick a new partner, or you can uh, move to talk to somebody else, however you wanna do it. I will give you about two or three minutes to sort of muck around with that, and then we'll come back and see what you have come up with.
Okay. I'm going to call everybody back um, now. If we could keep the lights up for a little bit um, until we talk. So anyway, I have to say, this has been great. You guys are such professors. There were such hand gestures going on. It was awesome. It was fun to watch. I've never had this many people doing this before. Um, OK, so what do you think was the text talking about? What were some of the ideas that were in that? There was a lot of gestures, so there must have been something going on. Okay, so hierarchy starting with God and then moving down, that's a big piece of what he's talking about in this text. Okay. <laughs> okay. So a hierarchical structure kind of makes you think vertically. And most of the time, as I told you, like the churches are more horizontal. So this is going to mean maybe shifting the focus a little bit for the parishioner. Any other ideas from the text that you want to throw out there? Okay, mystery symbols, yeah? Well, the first uh, reading talks about uh, divinity, perfection, and proportion, so it made me think that it, it should be built, it's processional, a long rectangular thing that's based on the golden section. Okay, or having some kind of balance, some kind of balance and um, proportion take, taken into effect. Okay, I'm sorry? Man is minuscule, uh, power of Okay. Right, so we want a big, big space. Okay, yeah. The idea that every component of the hierarchy should actually express the nature of the apex of the hierarchy. Uh huh. Okay, so everything's connected. There needs to be some kind of way to kind of bring it together, unify it in some way. All right, very good. I will tell you that we don't get that quickly to those ideas um, with undergraduate students. So bravo, bravo. Uh, so the second, the second part of this that is on the sheet, because I wanted you to have it, the second part is they have to actually map out a floor plan of a church. And that would have been really hard in this space, so you don't have to do that. Um, but you know, one of the goals I have for the medieval art class, just like I mentioned some of the goals I have for the overall Roman art class, one of those goals is I want them to be comfortable with reading a church plan. And so being able to draw one is, uh, you know, one way where I'm, I can kind of gauge how we're doing uh, with that. So I thought I would bring in, since you guys weren't going to actually get to draw, that I would bring in a couple of examples from this semester. I was so happy to have two that spelled altar correctly. That's uh, for a medievalist, that's a big hurdle. So I was very happy. And this was pretty early in the semester, so this was good. Uh, so you can see that, that one of them was really keeping to the idea of keeping the nave, keeping the horizontal. They hadn't quite gotten that idea of that verticality. Uh, when I asked them what, um, I keep forgetting I have a pointer. When I asked them, like, well, what is this? They said, well, those are balconies. Because they got the idea that there needed to be something higher, but they hadn't gone all the way to what you guys were saying about the vertical shift. But they knew something needed to be higher. And, and, and the way that they translated hierarchy was, well, this is where the um, dignitaries will sit. And like all the common people will be down here. And I was like, well, first of all, nobody's sitting, but OK. Uh, <laughs> they were shocked that everybody pretty much stood in the Middle Ages. They were like, oh, gosh, I'm glad I don't live then. Um, and then the other, um, the other plan that I took a, took a sh uh, photo of to include here does have uh, a roundness. Um, they were not exactly sure how to cover that space. Um, but they kind of got, they were getting to that idea of things connected and things interacting, and so they were thinking circular, but then their architectural prowess kind of um, wasn't there, so they weren't sure exactly how to make this. So some of you probably already know the answer, so thank you for playing around anyway and pretending you're an a undergraduate student, because the Byzantine answer was Hagia Sophia, and I think I even heard that a couple of times. Um, so this is what he, what Justinian had as his like 
this is the church. Uh, this became a symbol of Byzantine power, and uh, it is a church that has balance and proportion. Oops, gosh, I keep doing that. I'm so sorry. Um, so when you walk in, so there's an inner narthex and an outer narthex. These are sort of preparatory areas for getting ready to go into church. And then, so there is still that processional longitudinal line in Hagia Sophia, but once you get here, you're just completely into a vertical axis. You kind of forget that there is a horizontal axis. And what I'm trying to do in this exercise is to get them to understand that this was just, this was not just a, Justinian wants a new church, just because he's the emperor, that there were theological reasons for the change, that there was not a liturgical change, like they weren't doing anything differently in the space, but there were differences about how the space was perceived and how we on earth reflect the heavens and the dome becomes that reflection of where God is and that we're in the hierarchy and that we're in his image, all of the things that you guys were saying down to this balanced cross and square plan, which um, is not exactly the golden mean and the rectangle, but it is a very balanced having a circle within a square. I also wanted to share with you um, when we went on to talk about how this structure works, because we spent a lot of time talking about the arch and how the arch actually makes a lot of this building possible, uh, a dome can only be created if you understand how to build an arch. And on the last day of the class, which I should have mentioned the, the, the picture of everybody together, that was on the last day. And on the last day, I said, okay, what are you gonna remember from this class? And they all like almost in unison went, voussoirs, because the round part, the curved part of the arch is what keeps the keystone from hitting you on the head and killing you. And that is how an arch works. And that's also how you get a dome, is by having an arch that goes around 360 degrees. So they remember voussoir. I beat that into them too, because they were like, it's that V word. I'm like, voussoir. <laughs> um, but the other thing that they remembered is when we talked about, well, how do you get a dome on a square base? Because if you remember, the people who drew um, the uh, plan on the left, they were kind of like, I don't know how we're going to get that round thing on this um, regular base. The uh, way that the Byzantines did was what's called a pendentive, which is this section right here. And I got to say, it's taken me several years of teaching, but I finally found a way to explain the pendentive, which is take a piece of pizza, a slice of pizza, the cross goes on the base of the dome, and the rest of the slice goes down to the ground. They remembered that, except they kept calling it the pizza slice, pendentive, pizza slice. But anyway, they got the idea, uh, and they remembered that too. So that's how Hagia Sophia was able to incorporate a vertical accent that the theolog theologians were talking about. And this gives the students really a chance to um, apply that information again in something that's active. I wanna share one last thing about this activity with you. Um, when, I was fir when I first used it, it was like, I think I came up with this in like 2010. So I've been um, kind of tweaking it and working it. But the first time that I used it, uh, and, and also after they make their plans, they have to present them to the class. So they have to explain to the class how to read their plan and how it reflects to the text. So they have to be able to verbalize that uh, after spending the time doing it. And the very first time that I did this, we, you know, we, share, we shared all, they shared their plans, and then I showed them Hagia Sophia, and their, their response was, well, that's okay, but I like mine. <laughs> And I was like, okay, maybe this, maybe this was not, maybe this is going off the rails. And I said, well, you know, it's interesting because all of the plans that you guys sketched out were churches that were built. They just happened to all come up with something that had been built. And they said, well, we want to see them. And I was not planning to talk about those particular churches because they're just ones that are, you know, they're way off the beaten path. They're not, kind of like not major monuments. But there was such investment now. Um, that I said, oh, you know, I got to do it. I mean, like they, they got, you know, they, they have ownership here. So the next class I did take some time and I showed each one of these churches and they were so proud. They were like, that's ours, you know? And, uh, but anyway, so that just, again, I think shows that when you give them a chance to invest and apply information, I think it really does give them a, a, a greater sense of, you know, learning and engaging with it and, and, and remembering it. 
So um, kind of beginning to come to a close here because I know we want to have a little bit of time for questions if there are any. I thought I would sort of leave you with the way that I go about a class when I want to put active learning into it. So there might be a class where you are thinking, gosh, you know, I mean, a class period is what I'm talking about, like one class period where maybe you want to try to change it up a little bit and not have it be so much based on lecture, but again, a little bit of lecture is never bad. Um, what I do, and, and I, I found that I was stuck in, every time I thought about the content for the class, like I even mentioned that back with the Roman class, when I said, um, you know, Trajan's column rolled around chronologically, like here we go, it's 113, so that's what we do. When I kept thinking about the content, I would immediately think about lecturing. I would immediately think about all the things that you have to know about it, and then that would sort of crifle, stifle my creativity about what I could do with it. So what I started to do is, when I got to a monument that I knew I needed to cover, I started thinking, what's my learning goal for that monument? Like, what do I want them to leave the class knowing about it, not just it, but what is important about it? Like, why is it in the class to begin with? Uh, and so once I started to do that, I started to like loosen the shackles of having to say every single thing about that particular monument. So I usually lecture, so I figure out what is it that I want them to take away from the class. I usually lecture on some basic elements, so maybe I have to give them where it is, how big is it, uh, who would have seen it. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. If, it's, if it gives away too much information, then I won't tell them. Like there are a lot of times where I'll put a painting up without the title, they're like, what's the title? I'm like, we'll see. Because oftentimes the title will take them down an interpretive path too fast and they won't look at everything. So I'd, I sometimes leave some details out. And then I usually set up a problem. So I've given you some examples today with the fine Trajan and present him to, back to the class doing the abstract art example and having to lead a class discussion. So that's not exactly presenting, but leading a class discussion. And then the case study of you are an architect in Justinian's court, he wants a new church, what you gonna do? Uh, and then it's always usually group or pairs. And you know, I'm lucky that the biggest class that I've taught has been 30 people. Um, our class cap is usually 25. I was a sucker and let five in to the medieval class. Um, and then they usually um, do some work on the problem and then present or discuss to class if that's part of the uh, activity for the day. And then there's usually a time where we talk about it as a class. So we might, are there patterns, like the Trajan day? Um, they said, wow, like we were only looking at three scenes, but there was such repetition of like, he's always doing something and he's always with his troops. And they began to see that that was propaganda, that the, the emperor probably didn't do all of those things because he's the emperor, but he was shown doing it all for propaganda reasons. Um, I should mention also that that was a theme of the Roman art class and the focus group was during the election of 2016, so there was a lot of conversation about that that was very interesting. So we evaluate it as a class, whether that's a whole class discussion or whatnot, and then I try to incorporate more reflection pieces into my classes because I'm finding that that's actually where they make the connections. Like I already see them making the connections, when they do it, and so sometimes there's a, on my own part, there's sort of like this feeling of like, okay, they did it, like, yay, you know, they learned it, clearly they were engaged, and then like we wrap it up. But I'm trying to pause more and make sure that we end with a chance for them to sort of reflect on how all of this fit together, even if, I, even if that's just a, a, you know, writing on a card or what did you learn from this exercise, just something kind of brief like that. Um, can kind of help them have it gel more in their brains. At least I think that's what's happening. Um, so that's what I do. Um, so I was told to leave some time for some questions. So if there are any you want to discuss, that's great. And then here's some contact information. I'd love to follow up with uh, further conversations about active learning or teaching um, with you in the future. So thanks. Pressure. We're going to need to make our way over, but Dr. McKay will be with us for lunch, so you can mm -hmm. have more questions then. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if this is a really good question. <laughs> um, the first time you decided to do this, did you share with the class that this is something you and you were going to be doing 
uh, active learning in each class session, or did you just do it? No, I just did it. Um, I'm trying to think back. That's like a while ago. But I think it was just an internal decision that I made because I, you know, I never announced that I was going to have active learning assignments. We just sort of did it. Um, I sometimes give a little bit of a heads up about the reacting games because that does take between three and six class sessions to run a game. And so I feel like I do want them to kind of know that's coming. Um, but otherwise, I don't do a whole lot of like preparation. It's sort of, you know, I, I feel like I give them enough to get it going. Um, so no, I didn't announce anything. So that's a really good question. So what I have begun to do is, because I want them to be engaged in class, I've actually moved a higher percentage of the overall grade to class participation than from uh, exams or papers. So the papers are still really important to me, but I now have like usually like 25% of their grade is class participation. And I make sure that, you know, that includes absences. Like they know, like if you're not there, you didn't participate. I, I take role, like they, they know that. And I don't have many absences, like, and they are so apologetic when they're not there. And I usually get like, what did we do? <laughs> you know, it's not like, did I miss anything? It's usually like, what'd you guys do? Um, which is um, something that I'm really striving for, so I love it when I get that question. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I, so they don't get graded on individual things because I want to keep that it's okay to be wrong kind of uh, ethos with whatever they're doing in class. Um, but at the same time, I want them to take it seriously. So I think they know that that's, um, that that's how that's going to work. The uh, reacting games, though, when they have to turn in a paper based on their character and their research and their writing, those are graded. Those are graded assignments. Okay, maybe one more. <laughs> So in the reacting game, they totally take it outside of class. And um, when I asked some of the students in the current class, including the patriarch, uh, to stay after class one day to answer some questions, because I was getting ready for this breakout session, but, some, but for some also in-house um, application for a certain um, general education tag, I wanted some input from them. And all of them were like, you have to stay in character. You, and, and one of the requirements for this particular tag was do the students spend at least 15 hours um, on this activity? And they were like, <laughs> they were like, we're not even done with the game yet, and we've put in 15 hours. So they talk about how they have to do research in order to win. They have to do research in order to be um, persuasive. And so they're doing a lot of work outside of class. There's a lot of strategizing that happens outside of class in a reacting game because they have to get their plans ready before they actually come to class. So in those instances with the reacting game, yes, it spills outside of class. Sometimes one of the things that I found with a class of 30 was I'm gonna have to put some of the stuff on them as homework to be ready to come into class and do because there wasn't enough time, like with the Justinian, you're an architect, there was not enough time for every group to process the text, make the plan, and then everybody with 30 different people, even in groups, to pr present their plan. So if I do that in the future and I have a class that big again, I'm going to make sure I give them the text ahead of time and say, you have to read this for class. So I think if my classes continue to be as large as they are, I'm going to have to start doing that. They're going to have to be some outside prep so that the in-class in time can be more readily put to use right away. Thank you. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.